Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Phoebe Smolin, and right now I have with me Mary Lou Jepson, one of the foremost in one of the foremost innovators of display technology. She works alongside Mark Zuckerberg, some of you may have heard of him, and she has worked as the co-founder and the chief technology officer for One Laptop Per Child. So right now, we are in the caveman era of virtual reality. Can you project forward 20 years and describe what you think it might be like then? Well, I think it's a lot like, does anybody remember those big brick cell phones that were in the, in the 80s, and now we have these beautiful smartphones. I think we're gonna see the evolution of that in virtual reality, but much faster. That's, that's what we're tasked with at, at Facebook and at Oculus. And, and uh, we've got pretty good competition. So I think we're gonna see that evolve super quickly. And uh, is it gonna be implanted in your eyeglasses or your eyes or even in, your, in the brain itself is, is a, is a question as we look over 20 years. 20 years is almost infinity in technology. It so. really is. Um, so you started out pretty early as an engineer. Can you tell us a little bit about your early career? Sure. Um, I didn't think I wanted to be an engineer, but when I was a teenager, I, made, I was lucky enough to, to take a class in holography, and I made my first hologram, and it's the closest thing to a religious experience I think I've ever had. And after that, I knew exactly what I was going to do with the rest of my life, because I just fell in love with making 3D things and the, the optics of it and the light and all the really cool technology to really deeply understand what was happening in the physics. So that's how I got into this. So I've been kind of doing virtual reality and 3D and display stuff and hardware for like 30 years. So wow. I'm an electrical engineer, but an artist too. And you have a history with neurology, right? And you know a lot about it because you've had personal experience with the subject yourself. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I was, I was uh, 20 years ago, I was finally finishing my PhD in physics, but I was unable to. I had to drop out because I was, I was super sick. I was living in a wheelchair. I, I couldn't remember how to subtract. And so I, I didn't think I deserved to get a PhD. So I dropped out. Um, but then they found the brain tumor. So they had that sucked out and I could live, and I, I actually have to take pills every day for the last 20 years or I, or I die, but that got me really interested in neuroscience as a survival skill, um, self-preservation, and I've become really fascinated by the advances in, in neuroscience actually in the last five years. So I'm gonna talk about that later on today. Um, so right now, what do you think the coolest example of virtual reality technology or any technology in the field that you're working in is, um, like the Google Glass, or what do you find the most interesting? Like, what's the most compelling achievement you've seen? In virtual reality, the most compelling achievement, I mean, it, I'm not supposed to brag about our company. I would have to say the stuff that I can't talk about <laughs> that's in my lab is the most, exciting, uh, the most exciting stuff from my perspective, but that said, this really interesting period where people that I've known and collaborated with for decades, we're all friends and we're all working at the competing companies and I think very highly of them too. So I'm sure there's really great secret stuff in their labs too. And I think the first products are really going to market now. For, we just, uh, at Oculus, we just uh, started shipping our first consumer version of, of mobile uh, mm -hmm. this month and, and are putting our what we call the Oculus Rift into, into production in, in, in Q1 of next year. Uh, also, we're gonna see that happening with uh, our competition, and so what we're gonna see in 2016 in virtual reality should be pretty exciting, particularly for gaming and entertainment. But I think what we're all really interested in is what happens with, with presence. This is the best technology anyone's invented to date to make you feel present somewhere. And so you can feel present in a video game or on a mountaintop or with each other. Like we're having this experience talking and I'm, I'm really interested in what happens if you can be with anybody at any time through virtual reality. And I think that's, that's actually the killer app for, for virtual reality is presence. And I'm really excited to see how that unfolds over the next few years. So this work, um, I mean, it leaves a lot for us to look forward to because this is 
most popular technology right now, so it's what everyone's thinking about, what everyone wants to know about, so this is really exciting for all of us to have to look forward to in the future. Um, so what's it like to be a CEO? To be a CEO, yeah. <laughs> so I've been a CEO, so like you're the boss. Um, so it sounds great, like you're gonna be really powerful and the reality is you have to figure out the organization, everybody reports to you. Whenever anyone has a problem, guess what? That's your problem because you're slowing down a whole department or group because they're not being efficient. So everybody interrupts you constantly. So you have to learn how to do that. The board, you report up to the board. Their main job is to run the company and to fire you if you screw <laughs> up. So I actually haven't been fired, but that's actually one of the jobs of the, the board. And so you manage the board, you manage the company, and you, and you try to do it. So it seems very powerful. But in, in fact, what you, your job is to sort of lift everybody else up. But it's fun and, and exciting to be able to do that when you get to the point where you have this vision, you need to get people around it, you get people around it, and you just have to continue to realize that it's your job to debug, motivate, solve, stay up all night, all of those things. It's fun, but it's not, I think, what I thought it would be. Um, you have attended many schools, right, for various degree to attain yeah. various degrees. Can you tell me a little bit about the schools you went to, what you and what like why you went, and how that helped okay. you get to the point where you are now? Oh, right. I did totally useless stuff for most of my career, which is now really, really valuable. So I think that's really interesting because uh, my parents um, said they'd help me pay for college if I'd major in electrical engineering. So it's kind of game because I kind of like everything. I think a lot of kids like they're good at everything. But I just, after first, my first semester in electrical engineering, I'm like, whoa, I got to get out of this. This is awful. Because <laughs> um, I think the, the issue, and I think it's changing, like rather than these weed out classes, like make it pretty interesting as we're going through and make it compelling and project based. But so I went into art and I went into history and then um, I finished my double E program and I also double majored in art and then I went into really deeply into holography and then physics and then I was a computer science professor then I worked as a multimedia artist then I did a PhD in optics but I, I've sort of bounced around because I funded this all through really odd way. like I remember I funded part of my PhD by teaching history of science which is Usually the history professors like code for the history grad students code to like fund their history and it was the opposite for me. I was able to, I think, draw great solace as you look at the stories of the really great scientists and technologists who walk through incredible odds to achieve such great things where everybody thinks everything's already been invented and that was the easy stuff. When you look at what Galileo or Newton or Faraday walked through, you just, you become in awe. And so I, I think that a lot of that is missing from the way we teach technology because the stories are incredible. So yeah, I just did a lot of different stuff, thought I couldn't get a job and now, now I have these really nice jobs working for tech. I was working for Sergey Brin at Google and now I yeah, work for the market. At, Facebook. So it's been a really odd path. Well, I have a lot of more interesting questions, but we're on time constraints, so I have one more. Um, I know a lot of people in the audience today are here because they're interested in what you do. So do you have any advice for aspiring engineers or people who want to work in your field and how they can achieve their goals? Like, do you have any tips for them? Yeah, I suppose it's sort of double everybody says do what you love but like you also have to do the hard stuff and so the question is how how can you combine that like when you find something that you really like can you do the deep dive and do the deep dive in multiple areas to get really good at everything that surrounds you know it, it could be it could be absolutely anything that you're interested it could be it could be basketball right you could just love basketball and you could learn like all about physics and all about um, geography and like anatomy and everything from, from basketball and become like this incredible innovator in basketball. I'm not sure what that would look like <laughs> if, as you carry that analogy through, but that's my advice is go deep in multi, it's, it's like our educational system says it likes multidisciplinary stuff, but in reality, that's not how it's set up. And so 
I would advocate strongly for going deep in multiple areas around, around something you're really excited about. Well, it was a pleasure talking to you, and I hope everyone enjoyed our brief look into the life of a skilled engineer. So thank you so much for Thanks. coming out today. Thanks, Phoebe. Awesome. Thank you.